A very, very warm welcome to each and every one of you joining us here today. This is an extremely important session on community-led TB accountability, uh, priorities for the TB UN high-level meeting that's happening in 2023. The reason we do the work we do, and then sometimes we, we forget while we work in TB, um, we talk so much about research and science and all the medical jargon. The reason we do the work we do is so that we can save millions of lives from this preventable and curable disease. One of the strongest parts of any response, and particularly the TB response, would be would is would be if it is a community-led response. And we've been trying to have that happen in TB for a long time. The UN high-level meeting happened um, on TB happened in 20, 2018. And that was um, a very exciting time for us in the TB community because we thought, okay, finally, the world is taking tuberculosis seriously. And we had a whole bunch of amazing political commitments, uh, but delivery was very, very poor. And uh, governments did not live up to the promises they made at the UN high level meeting in 2018. So what followed after that was in 2020, we, and as the community came out with something called the deadly divide report where we gave a reality check in some ways of what the situation is on the ground with TB. And, uh, and we're, we're doing another deadly divide report just ahead of the UNHLM that's going to take place next year. And uh, I think this is an extremely important exercise to inform governments of what the situation is on the ground and for us to take action. Today, we have an extremely exciting panel of people, all of whom I know and love, um, the first speaker would be Miranda, and we have Austin who will speak after that. We call him Chief Austin. And we have James from Stop TB Partnership and Amrita from York University who will be speaking right after that. We would have a Q&A session. We're hoping to have a longer Q&A se session than expected uh, than usually happens in these sessions because these presentations are pretty short. Um, so I would request everyone to please put in your questions in the Q&A uh, box and we'd be sure to address them uh, if time permits. So thank you very much. I look forward to an exciting discussion and we can start with the presentations. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. My name is Marina Bayang from Indonesia and thank you for having me here. And today I would like to talk about community-led monitoring, one impact and TB accountability. We are here for one shared purpose to NTB. It is a clear global tar target from the UN High Level Meeting in 2018 with clear targets from diagnosis to funding, country level commitments such as ending TB stigma and discriminations and participations of TB key and vulnerable populations. Those have been developed to support TB communities, race and gender or CRG engagement and advocacy. Progress has been made with assistance from Challenge Facility for Civil Society, or CFCS, and also National Stop TB Partnership. In 2020, TB communities launched a report on TB accountability. We identified six areas for action for progress, including reaching all people for prevention, diagnosis, treatment, a rights-based TB response with communities at the center, development of essential new tools, investing funds, commitment to accountability and multi-sectoral and leveraging opportunities. During assessments, several key findings were identified across seven themes, including accessibility, stigma and discrimination, key populations, freedom, participation, gender and legal remedies. These barriers can only be tackled with the TB communities meaningfully involved. And for that, community-led monitoring or CLM is vital. Community-led monitoring is a system that increases accountability for health and social programs. It involves people who have the most at stake, recipients of services, in monitoring access to and quality of services and working to co-create solutions that improve them. CLM is based on routine and systematic oversight of local and national health and social systems and on consultations with community members 
to identify service gaps and areas for improvement and to inform advocacy campaigns and strategies. In health responses, CLM regards communities as key players within the health system infrastructure. It is communities that assess the quality of health services and advocate for corrective action. CLM involves the affected communities in ending TB. For this, One Impact CLM empowers people affected by TB to claim their rights, access health and support services, and report and eliminate TB stigma and discrimination. One Impact uses an, an, an innovative mobile application and system to encourage and facilitate the participation of people affected by TB in all aspects of TB programming. One Impact push a response to TB grounded in human rights, centering those most affected. By doing this, One Impact CLM addresses central challenges in TB response at the individual and community level by generating essential data to understand and overcome them. One Impact has been involved in 23 countries, piloted first in Tajikistan and CFCS 10 grand countries, as well as on the regional level. It starts from orientation, adaptation, and implementation to community engagement and data use. With One Impact, Communities have been mobilized and engaged in TB response. With 17,000 of people affected by TB using One Impact. It empowers communities with information, helping to fulfill human rights and improving access to TB care and support services. As seen from 11,000 accessing TB and human rights information. And 2,000 accessing TB service delivery center information. One impact also enhanced community mobilization through the online community forum Get Connected with 7,000 of people using it. The big communities also claimed and realized their rights with 10,000 reporting TB challenge and nearly 70% of them resolved. Ten countries also provided unique information on the availability, accessibility, acceptability, and quality of TB care and support services, including stigma and discrimination. One Impact has also been translated into 20 different languages, ensuring accessibility for as many as possible. But this is not the end. We still need to do more. There are several steps we can take to continue this progress. First, establish country commitments on TBCRG translate to the National TBCRG Action Plan. Evidence is available to ensure nuanced, targeted, and strategic intervention to overcome barriers from policies to provide access to quality services for all. Third, one impact is a considerable opportunity for TB affected communities to continue engaging in CLM. Four, further adaptation and piloting are needed to support community engagement. And last but not least, it is essential to remember that when we talk about TB communities, an emphasis should be placed on TB survivors and key and also vulnerable population. We are the ones living through them. So the community are crucial to ensuring all this work can genuinely end TB. Thank you so much for your kind attention. Thank you, Carol and me. Uh, for introducing me. My name is uh, Austin uh, Arenzo Biefna. I'm going to speak uh, a little bit more on TB community accountability, especially looking around the community engagement in uh, uh, during the uh, daily divide, the purpose of the daily divide, and actually the content. 
The purpose of um, the Daily Divide, as we know, is actually to bring out the voices uh, of the community, especially those voices that are mostly directly affected by TB, people who are often left behind. But apart from that, it's also as a whole part of a, a global community accountability process moving forward. Uh, one good thing about this report is that this report comes with a in the background of uh, the five key ask coming from the high level meeting in 2018. And also one beautiful thing about it is that uh, the additional area of engagement is about the COVID uh, pandemic because in 2018, we didn't have COVID, but leveraging the COVID-19 as a strategic opportunity to end TB, we needed to also highlight it as the last area for action, apart from the reaching the action, uh, the area for action, the CISCO area for action, reaching all people through TB diagnosis, treatment, care and prevention, making the TB uh, response right, based, equitable and stigma free, with communities at the center. And uh, a whole lot. But the most important thing is that this report has come at a very right time that countries are actually implementing uh, the report, using it as a guide, not only for the advocacy uh, purpose, but also holding their countries accountable, seeking for improved domestic financing, which is very key. We know that uh, the resources in TB has dwindled so much, even with the, the biggest donor, uh, in TB, which is supposed to be Global Fund, still have challenges in terms of reaching the milestone, getting the, the resources that is needed to require to end TB. We have the global plan 2023 to 2020, 2030 to end TB. And that global plan is so robust that if we're able to fund the global plan to NTP. I think we will definitely be patting ourselves on the back and saying, yes, we've really done well. Civil society are keen and complementary to public sector effort in, in TB response. But we need to make sure that we put in some kind of accountability mechanism to make sure that uh, countries are really following, accepting their pledge following what is needed to end TB and not just scratching on, on, the, on the surface. This report has given a whole lot of different perspective to TB response. And as we are working to uh, bring out the new report, Daily Divide 2.0 in uh, 2023, by March 2023. Also looking forward to the high level meeting in 2023, 20, September. This will tell you that um, the civil society and communities are well organized in terms of uh, uh, making sure that they are ready for the next level of uh, uh, actions to TB response, doing things differently to make sure that we, we reach uh, we become ambitious and reach a, a, a great milestone. And that thing is, uh, this report will be used not just only for increased domestic financing advocacy, but also for civil society to understand in terms of the epidemic in their, in their various countries. And also take into consideration those qualitative aspect of uh, TB response that we do not really mention because most of the times the reports coming from the national TB programs are quite quantitative numbers. They're just talking about numbers. People cured, people on treatment, people success rate. But we don't talk about how the people ended up there, the reason why the people are not ending up at the facility. We don't talk about the care that we give uh, to the people. So. Those qualitative, the, the, the rights-based approach, equitable rights-based approach, we don't talk about gender, we don't talk about uh, the, the stigma 
and discrimination that actually prevent people from ending up at the facility, even with the strong demand creation act, uh, advocacy activities that happen within the civil society and also the communities. But again, like I said, daily divide is the way to go. And uh, we're looking forward to your contribution to do Daily Divide 2.0. We are looking forward to launching it together like we did in 2020. And uh, like I said, that is the way to go. Thank you. Hello everyone. Thanks so much for the opportunity to, to join this really important discussion today. Um, as, as, like our, our, as the previous speakers have spoken about, there is a UN high-level meeting on TB in 2023 and a real central focus of all the advocacy work over the next 12 months will come from the community's work and the TB Community Accountability Report, A Deadly Divide. TB commitments as TB realities. As we heard, this is the second iteration of this report. The first one was a landmark, the first time in TB that we'd had a, such a, a community-led initiative of this scale. Um, and it's really fantastic to see that there's that the Stop TB uh, community delegation, developing country NGO delegation, developed country NGO delegation are again taking forward this important initiative. So the focus, I guess, of this part of the presentation is to build off some of the comments from, from the chairs and there, as well as the opening speakers and to think a little bit about um, a deadly divide uh, and its utility for advocacy and engagement. So firstly, the first iteration of, of this report. It featured inputs from over 150 partners in over 60 countries. There were six regional launch events in six different languages. There were six calls to action, 24 case studies. But, but the second iteration, it needs to be bigger. It needs to be more ambitious and it needs to be even more strategic. The Stop TB community delegation is developing a dissemination plan for advocacy, communications and engagement. So I suppose we've heard a little bit about the work that will be done and the processes for consultation, for participation, for input and design of the report itself. A bit about some of the, I guess, the, the key priorities and how it will be shaped by, by what's likely to be six calls to action um, around this, which also mirror the six key asks that the TB community will likely take to the UN high level meeting. But what's also going to be really critical is how then that report, that evidence, those calls to action are used at the global level with a range of different stakeholders, but even more importantly, at the country level as well. Now this, will, this I think, the deadly divide in and of itself can be seen as a, an advocacy manual for TB communities on the path to the UN high level meeting on 2023. It's probably the most important uh, advocacy piece that will come out for the UN high-level meeting. It's from communities themselves, predominantly in TB, high burden countries, but also those who are in, high, in, in sort of donor environments as well. But why it's so significant is it's, it is a voice that can, can be, it is a shared voice, a collective voice that also can be used to mobilize communities at the grassroots level and to really engage other critical stakeholders whether they be ministries of health, ministries of finance, the media, celebrities, it can, any number of stakeholders can be used as they were the first time around, but even more strategically here to try to scale up the participation and engagement of heads of state in the UN high level meeting and to ensure that the commitments that are featured in the political declaration are as ambitious as they possibly can be. We know that they really need to mirror the, the level of ambition that's in the global plan to NTB 2023 to 2030. And that will be something that I'm sure communities will be at the front line in championing that particular call. Now, there's over 100 uh, round 11 challenge facility for civil society grantees who are about to commence work 
um, on their grants. Their work, their work focuses on looking at things like advocacy, social accountability, demand generation, overcoming human rights related barriers to access. But they will all feature um, some, some particular focus and activities on uh, community engagement, advocacy, and promoting the calls to action from a Deadly Divide Report 2.0. In particular, this will be really targeting to ensure head of state participation at the UN high level meeting in 2023, and even more than participation, engagement as well. Having a head of state speaking about TB between now and the high level meeting, championing an ambitious targets, championing a human rights based approach, supporting increased financing and investment in the TB response are all things that are going to be of critical importance and will feature in the dissemination, advocacy and engagement plans going forward. Now, I guess to, to conclude, um, it's, this is a really, it is an important initiative. And I think now that we know a little bit about the process and the consultation from the earlier speakers, but then to also be aware that there will be this advocacy and engagement dissemination plan and a number of tools um, and that can be available for community partners and other partners at the country level to help them really share these, share the, the, the advocacy messages and the community priorities in this new report. What will be, you know, I think the last takeaway message that I'd like to, to leave with you all is just to encourage um, all of you who are maybe new to, to, to this TB accountability work to really reach out and look to engage. I know that Austin and Amrita and May and Carol, uh, other speakers, as well as many others who are involved in this report, would very much welcome your partnership, your input and your engagement, um, because we know that only collectively can we, can we raise our voices and have the mobilization and the coordination needed to really impact, to achieve the ambition that we need to end TB by 2030. So thank you very much for the opportunity to engage in this important discussion today. Back to, back to the co-chairs. Hello everyone, it's very good to be at the session with you today alongside Austin, Carol, May and James. I'm Amrita Dathri, a social science TB researcher based at York University in Canada, working with communities in South Africa and India who are affected by TB amongst other places. Following on what Austin has stated, I'm here to share the Envision process and priorities for the next Deadly Divide report. As with the first time, we are really looking to make some noise to ensure the voice of communities affected by TB are front and center heard and not just that, heard loudly at the UN HLM next year. Right now, we're heavy in the midst of gathering perspectives from the community, from you, from civil society actors, organizations, and other key stakeholders working in TB, including scientific experts, funding body representatives, TB survivors, advocates, social leaders, including wherever possible political leaders, to identify and highlight the areas in TB elimination where progress has been achieved, where gaps remain, and where priority recommendations exist for a way forward. We want to highlight community-led actions, successes, and concurrently point to areas where dire investments are needed, so the priorities of communities affected by TB are not just met, but are the pillars upon which political commitments and declarations at the high-level meeting are based upon. We're seeing six action areas coming out of this report. First, harnessing efforts put into COVID as an opportunity to end TB. Second, reaching all people through TB prevention, diagnosis, treatment, and care. Third, making the TB response rooted in rights-based, equitable, stigma-free approaches that are centered on communities. Fourth, scaling up domestic and international funding to end TB. Five, accelerating the development and access to new tools, and relatedly and finally committing multi-sectoral accountability and leadership in TB. We have an open call for everyone engaged in the TB response or who has a vested interest in ending TB to participate in a survey and have your voice heard. It's open access. So I really invite you to join in this effort. We've got six amazing regional leads working hard on outreach and trying to have as many voices included as possible through not just the online survey, but also interviews or group consultations. Each of these leads has been immersed in civil society led TB elimination efforts, and it's my privilege to work alongside them. We've got Timur Abdalu Abdullaev working in Europe. We have Marinda Sebeyan gathering community perspectives from Asia, Olaidia Kani and Bertrand Kampoor working with communities in Anglo and Francophone Africa, respectively, Deliana Garcia in the region of the Americas, 
Robin Wait consulting with people in higher income countries, and me as the extra hand on deck. Amongst us all, we've got several languages covered, so really, there is no excuse to avoid speaking with us and taking part in this effort. Thank you so much for your time. I'm really, really pleased to be here and to take any questions after others have spoken. I think that was a very informative uh, round of presentations, a lot to digest uh, at one time. And it's exciting to see the kind of work that's going around in the community. And uh, thanks, Amrita, for leading this work and all the people involved in delivering it. It's, it's just brilliant. Um, we have a question in the, in the chat box. And um, I actually would encourage everyone who's listening in to please type in your questions because we're looking forward to addressing them. Uh, and this is actually a bit of a... Uh, medical question. So I'm going to, I'm going to uh, direct it to Amrita. Uh, Amrita, so someone in the chat said that um, Afghanistan will expand DRTB ambulatory uh, treatment services and CHWs will provide dots to MDRTB patients. What is your recommendation on how to prevent CHWs from um, disease while they are facing uh, MDRTB patients daily to provide dot? Amrita, please. Thank you. I'm not sure if I'm the best person to speak to this, but I'll try. Um, I think COVID has taught us a lot actually about um, infection control and how to normalize it. Um, so I would follow that guidance, to be perfectly honest, you know, wearing the masks, making sure that um, the, the patient themselves does not feel um, stigmatized and at the same time the health worker is protected. I think a lot of sensitization and training needs to go with health workers, um, especially when they are doing home visits. That is a difficult job. Um, so that really the facilities need to be quite grateful for that. Um, and for the patients as well and their families, um, seeing somebody coming to the house uh, can, can have sort of two um, quite polar polar results. On the one hand, it could be really awful to have somebody coming to the house and be being identified as somebody with TB in the public. Um, on the other hand, if that visit is done carefully, cautiously, with some confidentiality, with some um, sensitivity in mind, it could really help to relieve and alleviate that patient's burden. Uh, but absolutely, infection control practices have to be met. Um, and, and it would be wearing protective equipment um, if it means including a visor um, and, and making sure that the health worker themselves is not immunocompromised in any way or having other co-occurring conditions. Um, you know, one thing that is possible um, is, is mobile health nowadays, right? And so mobile versions of directly observed treatment are very possible. Um, so literally, it, it could be, you know, standing outside of the house and calling the person or being in your own home and calling the person to make sure that they are taking treatment and don't have any questions or side effects that need to be dealt with. Um, so I do see that point of connection for DOT, whether it happen in person or virtually um, as a point of connection for people with TB. Um, and really, it, it it's less about observation and more about support provision, right? Um, so I'll just say that. Thank you. Thanks, Amita. Well said. And also, I mean, I think as a person who's had TB, once I got cured, my biggest fear was getting TB again because I knew what it was like. And I really uh, hats off to all the healthcare workers who day in and day out face that danger. And uh, please, I hope you're taking care of yourselves and, uh, you know, c covering up properly and doing all the precautionary things that Amrita has highlighted. Um, but I did want to add, uh, Ria, if I can, um, if the person from Afghanistan could maybe... Um complete the survey and put this as a priority recommendation, you know, protection of community care workers. I think that would be a really nice point to highlight. Thank you. Well, that's a good, that's a good point. Yes. And please, so whoever wrote that question, please uh, complete the survey. Uh, Amrita has put that in the chat, uh, all the, the surveys in various languages. Uh, so would really encourage you to fill out the surveys. I'm going to get James in. Uh, James, are you there? I've got a little bit of background noise, but I'm here. What would what can I help with, Raya? James, uh, just a quick question. So you mentioned in your presentation that um, what would be nice is to have the heads of state turn up at the UN high level meeting uh, next year. And uh, I wanted to hear your thoughts on how would how would civil society and people go about doing that? And are there any success stories where this has happened? Um, something to learn from. Just curious to hear what you have to say. So look, great to, great to be joining with everyone today. So I think that, look, everyone's priority for the UN high level meeting, it needs to be heads of state and heads of government. They need to be the ones there. They need to be the ones in the room. It's not enough for there to be ministers of health. 
TB to affect change needs to become acknowledged as a political issue, a social issue, a financial issue. It's obviously a health issue, but it's much more than that. And to affect the change we want to see, that's also the change that we are going to need to realize. So some success stories. I think that having communities as part of the country's official delegation is really, really key. So any civil society or community organizations, start lobbying, start advocating for that now. That will be the, the best in. Second, beyond that, have a national consultation. Be As civil society and community, you be the ones that organize. Invite your governments, invite other stakeholders, bring them together, develop a country position, a country statement that also captures all of those priorities. Thirdly, participate in this deadly divide process. Make sure that your priorities are captured there. And beyond that, also make sure that your country governments and beyond that are also really, really aware and they're willing to champion those priorities that you've also identified. And I think as a combination of those three things, that's really, really important. The final thing is that there are always meetings, engagements, discussions around health. Let's leverage all of them to bring TV and the high level meeting to the fore. Let's make sure that journalists are engaged. Let's make sure social influencers, make sure um, celebrities are engaged. And let's really also ensure that we transfer this out of a biomedical discussion to being a social and a discussion about people, people's lives, saving people's lives and the really importance of that. The priority, the prioritization of that and the fact that as citizens, the people who vote for our governments, that we want our governments to really champion that as well. Thanks, Raya. Thanks, James. Um, well said. And, um, you know, uh, talking about heads of state and Austin, are you there? Uh, Austin, can you hear me? I'm here, yeah. I'm here. Hey, Austin. Great you could join us. Yeah. Um, Austin, just in terms of priorities, right? Um, so for me personally, among all the priorities, the most important priority is we need funding for TB. Okay, and governments have not uh, delivered their promises uh, from 2018. And uh, we don't have, I mean, from everything from R&D to treatment and care, we don't have enough money to help save these lives. So that's that's just a personal observation and something that I think is important. Just curious to hear what you think. So, so, so I mean, I think funding and getting the heads of state to the UN high level meeting should be the priority. But what do you think? Are your priorities other than the key asks that were that were highlighted? Uh, I mean, I mean, I mean, it could be any of those key asks actually, one of those six. But uh, but what are what are, what are you what is you what are you feeling? Thank you, Ria, um, and uh, thank you uh, to other speakers, especially um, James, highlighting a lot of um, key areas and also what we you know in, in terms of how we want the processes to to be. First of all, you mentioned key priority in terms of financing, in terms of funding, is very, very, this is very, very key in terms of uh, full implementation of uh, our global plan 2023 to, uh, to, to 2030, you know, the global plan to end TB. But most importantly is the TB uh, vaccine 20, by 2025. We've been, we've been speaking a lot about TB vaccine, but nobody, we're not directing, we're, the advocacy is not we're not seeing people talking about TB vaccine, and we know that TB vaccine is actually huge uh, prevention. And we know that uh, we do not have any any TB vaccine. At, at the moment, there's no TB vaccine. Taking a cue from COVID-19, we political leaders, we are very strong, very ambitious, and uh, we, we could see uh, COVID vaccine in less than two years, you know, developed. So why can't we have TB vaccine, you know, also developed in that manner? So there's no urgency. So we need to see, we need to push, you know, strongly because TB vaccine for me is one of the biggest priorities so that we can also uh, pr uh, protect people who are now coming up and also protect, uh, you know, people who are also alive at the moment. So that is very key. TB fin uh, financing for TB should be, you know, done holistically because it cuts across. It connects different dots. So it's not as if we just be focusing on in one area. You know, you see countries not adopting, you know, uh, the, the new tools, quality uh, TB uh, uh, diagnosis. We see people engage in prevalence survey with sensitive tools. At the end of the day, they end up with a microscopy, which are 70 years old uh, behind. Why can't we focus on using those quality tools, those quality diagnostics? Also focus on patient-centered, 
take, taking people's pre, uh, pre, uh, 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 in terms of uh, their treatment uh, 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 pre, uh, preference, they should they should be able to to dictate what they what the kind of treatment they want to to take. We should also push for countries to take up. And now WHO is being doing a lot of rapid uh, 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 communication on reg on new regiment. We should push for countries to also adapt this. Countries should not stay behind, you know. So these are certain areas I think uh, we should push for. But in terms of my highest priority, you know, as, as as much as we are focusing on, you know, getting the political leaders to put in more effort in terms of being more ambitious, providing resources, the needed required resources to be able to implement the global plan to end TB by 2023, by to 2030 focusing on uh, getting quality diagnostics, focusing on TB vaccine, then focusing on uh, also providing uh, the uh, leveling ground for uh, everybody, especially the communities and the civil society, uh, to play that complementary effort with the public sector. Thank you. Yeah, well said, Austin. And thanks for reminding us about the global plan to end TB by 2030. I think that is a really key tool for us to help us with our advocacy um, at a national level, at a global level. Um, so in keeping in mind, um, you know, the whole accountability uh, framework that we're developing, I think it's also important to ensure that it complements all that all that we're asking in the global plan and you know making sure that um we first i mean the first step really is to input into this deadly divide report uh, that we're working on right now um amrita i'm just going to get you in um and you said this really important word which we use a lot in um, in global health and it's called multi-sectorial accountability um and amrita i want you to please let me know because uh, you know it's a heavy it's a loaded word and it's it sort of, sometimes it sort of goes over your head like what does that even mean right and uh, so i just wanted to understand what are your thoughts on multi-sectorial accountability uh, especially in the context of tb absolutely so i draw a lot from um you know the math tb the multi-sectoral um action and accountability framework for TB um, when I think about what uh, accountability in multiple sectors means. But essentially, it's really we're talking about different sectors within the health programs, as well as outside of the health programs. And so the civil society and community sector is one of those key sectors um, outside of the health program that come together in the TB response. And when we think about the actions that can be done and the commitments and declarations that everybody makes, the promises, many, many promises, um, the next thing to keep in mind is accountability. Well, you know, where where does where where have those promises gone? Where have those actions gone? Uh, and where have those commitments gone? So accountability is really about creating a pathway to ensure um, people are held accountable um, for what they have promised, um, not not as a punitive measure but as a, as a way to really move the needle. Um, otherwise, we're just talking about all the wonderful things we aim for, all our ambitions, um, but, but it just kind of keeps everybody in check when there is an accountability pathway. Uh, I know from work that we're doing elsewhere that it's not so easy to, to accomplish accountability. And uh, sometimes it's not so clear who one needs to be accountable to. Um, but I think all of us can agree that the one the one kind of entity that we have to be accountable to are the people who are affected by TB, right? Um, regardless of the donors, the governments, the different programs, the, even the different organizations, the person that's affected by TB is somebody that we have to keep in mind as the primary accountability um, target. Thank you, I hope that's clear. Yeah, that's lovely, Amrita, thank you. Um, Austin seems to be the most popular um, speaker today. We've gotten a couple of questions for Austin in the chat. Um, Austin, uh, the first question that's directed to you is, do you have a specific tool that communities can use to monitor implementations of the targets? Austin, can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Oh. Okay, in terms of, um, that is why um, we have um, one impact, the community-led accountability uh, um, this this is um, one big uh, uh, um, thing that the, the, the communities and civil society have put to, you know come to put together in terms of how to um, also monitor uh, the the progress in terms uh, for the high level meeting since 2018 
Not just that, the daily divide is also an accountability uh, 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 piece, a report that helps to follow up in terms of uh, the progress. At the country level, we know how to adapt some of these activities and also implementing CRG assessment in the countries. You know, having costed action plan helps us to also monitor in terms of where we are. Having our TB uh, stigma assessment done in countries helps us to know where we are in terms of, because these are a, a lot of, these are strong key ask. That, so if your country is able to, to show that you have able, you, you've done advocacy uh, to be able to implement CRG assessment in your country, this is a very big uh, a, a plus in terms of uh, some of the achievements within the, uh, uh, the high level meeting key ask. And also putting together, these are putting together a lot of uh, right-based, you know, gender-based uh, uh, programming within the country. Thank you. Yeah, and and to the to the next question as well, Austin. I think you answered a part of it, but what are the key priority asks for the Africa-affected communities on TV, and what opportunities do we have for resources to stream down to the grassroots level? In terms of. Um, the key ask, if you ask me, because uh, I still maintain that uh, we are still far behind. We, if we're able to, to implement even 20% of, uh, of, uh, of the key ask, you know, even 40%, let me say 40% of the key asks from the high level within 2018, I would say yes, you know, in terms of it, we've really, you know, seen uh, uh, TB having uh, prior, been prioritized by uh, uh, strong big leaders, political political leaders. But no, you know. So in terms of key as we are still maintaining a lot of uh, because we've not we've not moved, you know, from where we are as a, as a then. You know, we are not even before COVID. We are not uh, on track. So we still want to see more funding, you know, more uh, financing for TB more domestic resources. We want to see our political leaders put more, more money into TB, not just waiting for Global Fund to put the resources, because we know Global Fund resources is just an additionality. It's not meant to fund the whole uh, you know, TB program, you know, uh, uh, need in terms of the TB response in the country. So we want to see political leaders putting more money. We want to see uh, uh, our, uh, our uh, uh, political leaders working hand in hand with communities Making sure that uh, uh, national TV programs, you know, accept a lot of uh, uh, these key accountability mechanisms that also hold not just also not just holding the the public sector accountable, but also holding the communities accountable themselves as well. So these are uh, very strong because uh, for me, I do not see the reason why we should not embrace certain uh, uh, mechanisms that will help to, you know, create. A good optimal use of resources and also monitor what we do and evaluate to know whether we are, we are doing it right or whether we should be able to go back and also change a few things to be able to make it better. Thank you. Thanks, Austin. That's what we want, a better future for everybody affected by TB. Um, I have another question in the chat and I'm going to direct it to James. Um, James, I know you've worked a lot with communities on the ground uh, throughout your career. Uh, the question is, how can we better mobilize a grassroots level community-led call for financing TB R&D? I think it's a really important question. And I think that there's, uh, you know, it might be useful to even take a step back a little bit from this, to, from the R&D to just sort of say, how do we best mobilize grassroots for community advocacy? And I think it, um, it starts with, you know, the opportunity to build capacity to be engaged to have an op to have a platform where people can be heard and to where they can share their priorities and 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 i think it's a call for for donors to really invest in initiatives that enable that one initiative is challenge facility for civil society which usaid together with global fund provide a great deal of support from but there are still many countries that don't necessarily have that access or have that opportunity to to reach out to that and that's but one one example. Another is obviously countries in their TB responses have national strategic plans. And we need to also see this exact approach of mobilizing, of capacitating, of engaging, empowering, 
communities at a grassroots level to be a, a key pillar of national strategic plans. So it's not just that communities are engaged as almost passive recipients of care or as you know invited invited on the side to, to attend, but actually have a leadership role and the opportunity to meaningfully participate. So I think you know that change in sort of approach and that really like shifting towards that more social and, and, and grassroots approach is really key. And the final point is I think that there are tools that can really help support this. Tools that like enable communities at a grassroots level to mobilize, to build capacity and to lead through doing. Uh, Austin mentioned two, he mentioned community-led monitoring and he mentioned the CRG assessments. These are just two, but they're really good examples where you have the grassroots leading the process, building partnerships with other civil society and community, building bridges with national TV programs and health providers to really, I guess, provide a joint agenda and a joint way forward to adjust, pri address priorities. And so I guess coming back to the, the question on, on, on sort of these new tools, the same principle applies. How do we, how do we mobilize? How do we build capacity? How do we provide investment to ensure, ensure people can take this forward? And collectively, there are approaches at work but as a TB community, we just really need to prioritize and advocate for them to be scaled up. Thanks, Ray. Thanks, James. I couldn't agree more. And and in fact, um, like personally, my, myself, I mean, when I got TB and when I got cured from TB and I got so interested in how messed up the TB response is once I went through it, um, it was only these grassroots level organizations, uh, which, you know, I found on Google and it was Reach and uh, the union. Uh, who I reached out to and said, you know what, I'm a person affected by TB and I just, I cannot believe what I went through and I just want to do something to help because, um, and, and it was, I mean, it was organizations like that that actually helped. And I know organizations like that are, are supported by, um, by, by something like the challenge facility. So um, I would really encourage donors to fund um, uh, initiatives like that. Uh, where communities are empowered. Um, many times communities are just seen as, you know, we're voluntary workers uh, and that's not what, what it is. Um, I think it's important that we're fully resourced and ensure that we, we create impact on the ground. Um, but thank you so much, everybody. Uh, we're a couple of minutes over time. Uh, so we're going to close this session. I think this was super interesting. Um, Amrita has posted those, um, uh, the, the, the forms you need to fill out. Um, the surveys so i would really encourage everybody to please fill out those surveys in your language that it's there in french and russian in spanish and in english so thank you very much for joining us today we had a pretty full room and i'm happy uh, to see the kind of uh, interaction we had um please join us in the fight um please support communities uh, in everything that you do and thank you for being part of this discussion this this afternoon have a great day everybody